podcast host, Louis Lord Nelson. Hello, and welcome to UDL in 15 Minutes, where educators discuss their experiences with UDL. I'm Louis Lord Nelson, UDL author and leader. Today, I'm talking with Jana Nickel, who is a grade three elementary educator at Island View School in St. John, New Brunswick, Canada. Today, Jana's gonna share how she designs her classroom layout and promotes executive functioning. Hi, Jana, how are you? I'm great, thanks so much for asking, how are you? A close-up shot of Jana Nickel. I'm wonderful, thank you so much, and thank you for being here. Um, Go ahead and share with us your teaching background. I've been teaching since 2005. I started out in high school and I was teaching ESL and humanities and resource and methods. And uh, I moved to elementary school in 2008 and have been there ever since. A screenshot of Island View School's homepage. Uh, I've spent about half of that time in methods and resource and the other half in the classroom. Okay. So do you have other degrees, education, that kind of thing? Uh, Well, I finished my master's degree in 2013, but um, during my studies then, uh, that's when I first discovered UDL, and uh, I fell in love with the framework immediately. So I spent a semester researching UDL extensively, and uh, I wrote a better practices paper on increasing student engagement through UDL. This was something I had just taken on in my own as a part of my coursework uh, Ah. when I was doing my master's degree. Ah, fabulous. Fabulous. All right. So what is the makeup of the student population in your classroom? A screenshot of Island View School's introduction page, listing information about their students and their school. Uh, Well, we have full inclusion in the New Brunswick education system, so my classroom is pretty diverse in makeup. I teach a grade three class of 22 students this year, um, three of whom are on the autism spectrum. And about a quarter of them have uh, ADHD diagnosis. I also have one student who has dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia, and another student who's cognitively delayed. And my school has students from, uh, well, we're right in the city, but we also have students in our zone from uh, neighboring suburban and rural areas. Okay. You also host that website. A screenshot of the UDLproject.com. Yes, uh, the UDL project, all one word, dot com. Tell us about that website and how it got its start. Um, well, it all started when uh, the New Brunswick Department of Education, they uh, developed a partnership with the University of New Brunswick uh, to create an action research opportunity for schools. So um, the call was put out to uh, submit proposals to complete some action research on uh, universal design for learning. And I was a part of a team of four teachers uh, from Island View School, and we submitted a proposal together, and we were selected. So that was really exciting. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So we spent the next two years uh, conducting our action research, and our main focus was on increasing student engagement and learning through uh, the implementation of UDL in our classrooms. Okay. Well, we wanted to share our findings. Uh, We also... uh, found a lot of resources and uh, made some of our own along with some lesson plans. And uh, we wanted to share them easily uh, with the other action research teams and any other educator who was interested in them. Uh, So we decided to make a website for this purpose. And that's how the UDLproject.com was born. Oh, okay. And so then even after it ended, you just kind of kept going with it, didn't you? I just couldn't restrain myself. (laughs) (laughs) That's uh, wonderful. Yeah, I kept the website going, uh, add new content and blogs over the years, uh, because the project ended in 2015, and I still maintain the website. Um, I'm really passionate about UDL, so it's awesome to have an outlet to share ideas. I've also uh, made a lot of contacts through the website along the way, along with um, its associated Twitter uh, account at the UDL project. And I've joined some PLNs, and I've, uh, which lets me learn a lot from other educators from all over the world about how they're uh, UDLifying their own practices. Yeah. So yeah, it's been a lot of fun, and uh, I, it's just it's a really nice to uh, network with other educators who share my interests. So it's another example of outreach and a way that people who are implementing UDL were 
just so curious to connect with one another because it is a framework and it can be implemented in so many different ways that it's incredibly important that we have these connections and ability to share our stories with one another to say, oh, that's how you thought about perception, or that's how you thought about expression and communication, or rather, that's how you saw it play out in your classroom. Yeah. And, you know, it's, um, and it's surprising how, uh, you know, when we share information about uh, how we use the principles that we find things we're already doing. We yes. go, oh, that is UDL after all. And, and you have this epiphany and you're like, okay, I'm already doing some things. This is not so overwhelming after all. Yeah, things connect back and feel natural. And then I think it gives you that safety point of saying, wow, if I'm here, then that means I can take another step forward. So like you said, it's not so overwhelming. You don't feel like you're starting at zero. All of a sudden you realize, oh, there are some things that are natural to me. And so now I feel good about exploring some things that maybe are just outside of my melu just a little bit. Well, yeah, because, you know, it's um, I think it's better to take on. UDL piece by piece. I don't, I don't think it's something you can just switch gears and do completely all at once. A graphic of the UDL framework. Yeah, yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Okay, I've taken us down a rabbit hole. I know I have, because usually we just talk about what people are doing in their classrooms, and you have a great story to tell, of course, of goal direction and then also executive functioning in your classroom. So could you share that? Yes. Uh, so like I said, UDL um, is really big, so I find it's better to start small. And uh, at the beginning, I decided to universally design the physical space in my classroom as much as I possibly could. Bins labeled with tags, including pencils with a picture of a pencil, or glue sticks with a picture of a glue stick. Uh, so, for example, all of the materials that students use, they're kept within arm's reach, uh, and they're in baskets which are labeled with words and pictures. So, for example, the glue sticks are in a basket labeled glue, but it also has a picture of glue on it. And that way, everyone can find the glue even if they're struggling readers. Mm -hmm. uh, my notebooks, they're color-coded by subject. Uh, so the math books, for example, would be blue, and they're in a basket labeled math along with a blue sticker. And this makes it way easier for the students to uh, locate the materials and return them to the right place. Bins labeled with things like number of the day, basic facts, math, calendars, language arts, cursive writing, filled with colored folders that also match the color on the front of each bin. Um, now, I have not gotten around to this yet because the need hasn't arisen, but this system could easily be adapted for visually impaired students as well. So in addition to the visual labels, you could use a brailler and add braille labels to the baskets too. Yeah. Um, and then in addition to... Uh, accessing materials. Uh, I keep a visual schedule on my wall for my entire class to follow. A pocket chart with the day of the week at the top and then the daily schedule cards listed below it. And um, each activity we do for the day has uh, text and pictures. Again, so the struggling readers can also, um, you know, understand them. Like for instance, the card for dismissal has a picture of a bus next to it. And uh, visual schedules are often used as a accommodation for students who have autism, but I like how it benefits everyone because I think every student likes to know what to expect each day. Yeah. So this is a great example of understanding the variability of your students, but then you're like, okay, everybody's going to benefit from this, exactly what you just said. Everybody's going to benefit. So let's, let's put it up there. And then the students who are maybe like, maybe they can easily do the schedule in their head it's not hurting anything. It's right there for them. And so those students who do want to re reference it and refer to it, they can look up there really easily. It's beautiful. Well, and it's also um, less work for the teacher, because if you, like me, have two or three students in your class who have autism, you don't have to change the visual schedule on each of their desks. You just have one on the wall for everybody. So it is a mutually beneficial arrangement for sure. Right, right. And then you've physically um, placed uh, tables, chairs, and then you have some flexible seating, right? Uh, yeah, the tables in my room are arranged so uh, anyone can get around them easily, even if you're, say, using crutches or a wheelchair. And my room isn't especially big. I just avoid collecting furniture that isn't necessary to have. Uh, for example, I retired the big clunky teacher desk a few years ago, and I will never go back. <laughs> it took oh, up a lot wow. of space, yeah. <laughs> 
four boys seated around a table, two sitting on milk crates, one sitting on a chair, and one sitting on a stool. Yeah, it does. You're right. You're and right. And it's really not necessary. Um, I, there are definitely other ways to store your materials. And uh, when I do need like a table to work on, I either sit by the students or make use of uh, our guided reading table. Nice. Oh, that's a great example because you're exactly right. That's like this big clunky thing. It just takes up space. Yeah. Um, so then it then, makes more room for the students, you know, you, and you're able to have way more open spaces for your students to meet um, or uh, have more room to arrange your tables so people can navigate around the room easily yeah. as well. It's tr truly student centered. That's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> that's really good. And then flexible seating. You utilize that too, don't you? A tall laundry basket filled with yoga mats, sitting next to a stack of stools. I do. Uh, all the students have tables with traditional chairs at them, but they can opt to put their chairs away. Uh, we stack them uh, in a certain spot, and it takes up very little space. And they can use yoga mats or milk crate seats. We also have stools and cushions. Uh, my students do have the freedom to choose where they sit. Um, within reason. And they have access to clipboards to write on if they need them. Uh, they really like having the ability to choose where they sit and what to sit on. Two boys sitting on a yoga mat reading books. Yeah. So that's your physical space. Now, we also talked about how you um, use goals and goal setting in your classroom and then student participation in that. And it's, it's a wonderful story. Four small whiteboards labeled science, social studies, community wellness, language arts, and math, each with student goals written in student-friendly language. Oh, thank you. I was pretty happy with my physical space, so I decided to shift my focus uh, to making goal setting uh, at the front, forefront of learning. Uh, I began by posting my learning outcomes in student-friendly language, and I thought, hey, this is great. Um, but in the beginning, I've I wasn't referring to them very often, and I think it was just noise on the wall that students tuned out. Uh, so it all changed when I did two things. I created a goal board, and I added a goal reader as a classroom job. Um, so my goal board has a whiteboard for each subject, and I keep uh, that updated regularly, and they're written in student-friendly language. But then like in uh, a lot of elementary classrooms, I have a jobs board. They love helping at that age. And yeah. so in addition to things like line leader and pencil sharpener, there's also a goal reader. And so that person's job each week is to read the goals aloud um, that we're working toward for each subject area. Uh, so when we begin math, for example, the goal reader reads the math goals before we begin the lesson. Ah, what have you done with your environment to support students who maybe just aren't so comfortable reading out loud? Um, well, I, it doesn't take long to get to know your kids. Right. And the, the jobs are on a weekly rotation. So, you know, if there was someone who um, might freeze up at the possibility of reading in front of everyone, I probably wouldn't select that person for a job. But there are still plenty of other classroom jobs that they can do and that they enjoy doing. So it's right. not like they're left out of the whole process. Uh, you know, it certainly wouldn't be fair to uh, put someone on the spot. And if a student said, um, I don't feel like it today, they can certainly choose a classmate who to do it for them. Yeah, I'm open to that. I mean, I think it's important to be flexible. A pocket chart with the class jobs listed, along with names of students listed next to them. Absolutely. And you just nailed it. So you've got this great system there that are helping your students really work on that executive functioning piece, right? That goal setting piece. But at the same time, you've done a beautiful job of supporting them all the way through those affective networks. Because we know we have students who just get uncomfortable when they, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to read out loud. You know, they, just, they just don't feel confident there. And you've created this environment where A, Obviously, you've gotten to know your students, but B, that flexibility is there. So if they're like, mm, I'm not feeling so comfortable with this right now, or they look at you and you're seeing like fear in their eyes, you're like, okay, let's let's switch to the next student. And that's the beauty of understanding these underlying pieces of UDL and having that deep understanding of why you're doing what you're doing. A graphic of the UDL framework. You just It's a great example, and I'm so glad that you shared it. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're you're very welcome. Uh, so we have come to our 15 minutes. It is always so fast, but 
I really think you have given some great, like I said, some great and beautiful examples that are going to help some teachers think through that deeper question of why they're doing things. Because we can all kind of do what the guidelines say, but you've really helped people, I think, dive a little bit more deeply into the why behind what they're doing, which is the major kind of instigator of the UDL framework. So thank you so much for being the guest on this week's UDL in 15 minutes. A selfie of Jana Nickel, followed by the UDLapproach.com forward slash media short video, followed by the podcast logo with Louis Lord Nelson, podcast host. Oh, you're welcome. And thanks so much for having me. Oh, you're very, and a very lot of welcome. fun. Oh, great. I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, so for those of you who are listening to this podcast, you can find supplemental materials like an image montage with closed captioning, that montage audio description, a transcript, and an associated blog at my website, theudlapproach.com forward slash media. And then finally... If you have a story to share about UDL implementation for UDL in 15 minutes, you can contact me through the UDLapproach.com. And thanks to everyone for your work in revolutionizing education through UDL and making it our goal to develop expert learners.